Hello YouTube. So uh, a short while ago I did a video on logical nihilism, the view that there are no laws of logic, uh, and I thought I would revisit that topic today. Uh, now the main argument for logical nihilism proceeds by presenting counterexamples to purported logical laws. Uh, here's the argument uh, as given by Gillian Russell, who is the most prominent philosopher uh, who has discussed logical nihilism. Uh, so, premise one, to be a law of logic, a principle must hold in complete generality. Premise two, no principles hold in complete generality, so there are no laws of logic. Um, as I say, I already have a video on this, so um, if you want more detail about this, then you can go and watch that previous video. Uh, but the basic idea is, um, we show, so, uh, with respect to premise two, that no principles hold in complete generality, we show that a principle uh, fails to hold in complete generality by presenting a counterexample to that principle. So if we take, for instance, modus ponens, uh, if P then Q, P therefore Q, well, we could give a counterexample to this by presenting a case where if P then Q is true, P is true, but Q is not true. Uh, that would show us that modus ponens fails to preserve truth in all circumstances. Um, so, as I say, I, I talked about this in the previous video, but in that video I used some highly technical counterexamples, and what I want to do in this video is present some more everyday cases. Um, I think in that, in that previous video this might have seemed like a very, well, just, just a very kind of technical point, um, but what I'd like to do here is show that this does actually connect to everyday reasoning. So, um, uh, as I noted in the previous video, whenever somebody presents an apparent counterexample to a logical law, there will always be many ways to respond to that apparent counterexample. You might try to argue that it isn't really a counterexample, so in fact it doesn't challenge the logical law, and we will note a few of these alternative responses throughout the video. But of course one way to respond to a purported counterexample is just to accept it, to accept that the logical inference rule fails in that particular case, and this would show that the inference rule is not universally valid, that it doesn't hold in complete generality, so it's not a logical law. Um, another point to note here, uh, I'm not going to present counterexamples to every purported logical law, that would obviously take too long, so uh, even if you accept that the counterexamples seen in this video are conclusive, you might not embrace logical nihilism. An alternative position is what we might call logical minimalism, which holds that there are some laws of logic, but far fewer than we might initially have supposed. Uh, so maybe the laws of logic are only things like identity, conjunction introduction, disjunction introduction. Um, maybe these things hold in complete generality, but of course this is far less than what we use in our everyday reasoning. Um, so that would still be a pretty significant uh, conclusion. But what I'm going to focus on in this video is uh, modus ponens and modus tollens. So these are central uh, logical uh, laws, right? central um, argument forms. Well then, let's start off with modus ponens. A famous case here is given by Van McGee in his article, A Counterexample to Modus Ponens, which, um, <laughs> as the title suggests, presents a counterexample to modus ponens. So we all know modus ponens, if P then Q, P therefore Q. Uh, McGee gives uh, a couple of counterexamples which use embedded indicative statements. So here's, here's one of them. He says, OK. Opinion polls taken before the 1980 election showed that Ronald Reagan, who was of course a Republican, was far ahead of Jimmy Carter, Democrat. The other Republican in the race, John Anderson, was a distant third. Now, let's assume, just for the sake of the argument here, that the polls are reliable. Um, this is, of course, this is just an assumption, right? Uh, the polls may not actually have been reliable at the time. I don't know what the epistemic status of polling was back then. That doesn't matter. Let's just assume that we have a good reason to trust the polls. Well then, we should accept these two premises. So premise one, if a Republican wins the election, then if it's not Reagan, it will be Anderson. Um, I mean, this actually is, yeah, this is obviously true because Anderson is the nearest Republican in the race, um, so after Reagan, right? So, so if Reagan gets shot or something, but a Republican still wins, then it's going to be Anderson who wins because Anderson is the Republican uh, who's closest to Reagan. Uh, 
Uh, premise two, a Republican will win the election. We have good reason to believe this because Reagan will win and Reagan is a Republican. Now, clearly, this is of the form if P then Q and P. So we can apply modus ponens to produce the conclusion, if it's not Reagan who wins, it will be Anderson. Trouble is, doesn't look like that conclusion is true. Right, like even if we accept the truth of the premises, um, we shouldn't accept the truth of the conclusion. Uh, we, the, so the premises are true, right? But the conclusion isn't. Um, Anderson uh, is is not going to win. Uh, if it's not Reagan who wins, it'll be Carter. Um, so, I mean, again, we believe this on the basis of the polls, but we have a we have true premises and a false conclusion, or so McGee suggests. So here's another example. Suppose I see what appears to be a large fish writhing in a fisherman's net in the distance. Uh, I accept. If that creature is a fish, then if it has lungs, it's a lung fish. This is true just by definition. That's what lung fish means. Premise two, that creature is a fish. I believe this on the basis of perception. Now, if you apply modus ponens, that yields the conclusion. If that creature has lungs, it's a lung fish but I don't believe the conclusion. Lungfishers are rare. It's much more likely that if the creature has lungs, it's a porpoise or something else. Um, so these arguments suggest that modus ponens is not universally reliable, uh, even in cases of everyday reasoning. Uh, the failure here occurs when we embed indicative conditionals into other conditionals. But this isn't a particularly unusual form of reasoning. None of the premises in the arguments we've just presented are particularly sophisticated or, or noteworthy. I mean, these seem like fairly normal kinds of arguments. So how might the defenders of modus ponens respond to this? Well, one way out is to say that modus ponens holds specifically for material implication, for the material conditional. I have a video on material uh, implication, which might be worth watching, or I think it's called the material conditional. Um, anyway, on the material analysis, a conditional if P then Q is true, just in case either P is false or Q is true. We can summarize the material conditional with the standard truth tables from classical logic as shown here. So um, yeah, so, so as you can see, right, in any situation in which the um, antecedent is false, in which P is false, the material conditional is true. Um, and of course, any situation in which Q is true, the material conditional is true. It's only when P is true and Q is false that the material conditional is false. This does have some peculiar consequences. Um, on this analysis, uh, if my cup is empty, then Santa Claus exists, turns out to be true because my cup is actually full. My cup is full. So the statement, if my cup is empty, empty then Santa Claus exists, is true on the material analysis. Uh, even stranger, perhaps, is something like this. If Captain Beefheart did not write Trout Mask Replica, then Captain Beefheart wrote Trout Mask Replica. That's true on the material analysis, because again, the antecedent here, Captain Beefheart did not write Trout Mask Replica, that's false. Um, and whenever you have a false antecedent, the, over, the conditional as a whole is true on the material analysis. You don't even have to look at the consequent. Uh, so if, if you know that the antecedent is false, that's it, the conditional is true, period. Um, oh, and another example. If I die in five minutes, then tomorrow I will go for a run. Again, that conditional is true because I will not die in five minutes. At least I certainly hope I won't um, because that won't give me time to finish this video. So we would all lose out if I die in five minutes. Um, anyway, you know, if you've done any course in logic, you'll be familiar with uh, this analysis of the conditional. Now, in the examples that we've uh, given, the, the, the McGee counterexamples, these raise no trouble for modus ponens if we interpret the conditional as a material conditional. Because in all of these cases, if you look at the uh, conclusions, um, so if it's not Reagan who wins, it will be Anderson, or uh, if that creature has lungs, it's a lungfish. If you take those conclusions, the antecedents of the conditionals are false. So the conclusions are true. So, you know, in, in the first case, right, if it's not Reagan who wins, it will be Anderson, but Reagan will win. So the conditional is, is, is true because 
the antecedent's false. Um, so that means the, the argument actually has a true conclusion. The supposed counterexample to modus ponens, remember, for this to be a counterexample, we need true premises and a false conclusion. But if we interpret the conditional as a material conditional, then it's actually a true conclusion. Um, and the second example, if that creature has lungs, then it's a lungfish, but that creature doesn't have lungs, so the conditional is true. You know, so, so um, again, it's, we're looking for an instance of modus ponens that has true premises and a false conclusion, but if you, if you adopt the material conditional, then the arguments given by McGee actually have true premises and true conclusions. Um, and when you think about how these examples work, it does seem that in any similar case, we're going to end up with a conditional, with a false antecedent. So it will be true. Now, the obvious problem with this move is that it is, is that the natural language English conditional is arguably not the material conditional. Certainly we would find it, well, arguably we would find it very difficult to operate only with the material conditional. Um, after all, if the natural language conditional is a material conditional, then all conditionals with false antecedents come out true, which means that all counterfactual conditionals come out true. Every claim about how things would have been had things been different will be true, um, which seems kind of absurd. Um, you know, so we, we can, of course, restrict our language so as to ensure that modus ponens is valid in all circumstances. So, you know, we, we can insist on interpreting the conditional as a material conditional in all circumstances. But then it's not clear that we're really talking about reasoning in general, because we don't reason with a restricted language like that. So I mean, it's, it is worth bearing in mind this, this question of, OK, what exactly is the point of logic? Well, there are a variety of roles that logic can play. But um, you know, what, the, the basic use of logical systems in philosophy is to characterize good reasoning. Uh, we can develop any number of logical systems for any number of reasons. But when philosophers debate about which is the right logical system, what they're asking is, which of these systems captures the correct reasoning patterns? Um, so, so we're looking for the reasoning patterns that hold in complete generality, that hold in all circumstances. Uh, a philosopher who is a dialetheist who believes that there are true contradictions will be committed to the view that the right logic is some sort of paraconsistent logic, because they will say classical logic gets, gets things wrong insofar as in classical logic a contradiction entails everything. Um, uh, but, you know, actually there are true contradictions, um, and obviously, well, it's not the case that everything is true. Um, so there, there, there are true contradictions, so classical logic doesn't hold in those circumstances. So the right logic, the, the, the logic that does capture the fully general reasoning patterns, must be some sort of paraconsistent logic. Um, so, you know, the, the point of these, these counterexamples and the other counterexamples for the logical nihilist is that perhaps there just are no universal rules that can be stated in formal logic that characterise good reasoning. Now, if you insist that modus ponens holds only for material conditionals, it's not clear that you've really avoided the logical nihilist conclusion, unless you can also show that the natural language conditional is a material conditional, or, or at least that we ought to reason only with the material conditional, or something like that. Okay, another response to the McGee examples is given by Sinnott, Armstrong, Moore and Fogelin in their article A Defence of Modus Ponens. Their key point is that logical laws are supposed to preserve truth. They're not designed to preserve grounds for belief, or probabilities, or anything like that. When we say that modus ponens is a logical law, what we mean is that the truth of the premises entails the truth of the conclusion. Now their objection is that McGee, in his counterexamples, conflates rational belief with truth. Sometimes premises that are it, like taken in themselves rational to believe may entail a conclusion that is, uh, again, taken in itself not rational to believe. In the examples given by McGee, we may well have good reasons for, for believing the two premises, even if we uh, don't have good reasons for believing the conclusion. After all, McGee does proceed by citing reasons to believe the premises and the reasons not to believe the conclusion. So it seems his focus is on the grounds for belief. So they think that all McGee has shown with his examples is a failure to preserve grounds for rational belief. But that's not something that modus ponens was designed to do anyway. Is this point persuasive? <laughs> 
Uh, so Christian Piller, in uh, his article Van McGee's Counterexample to Modus Ponens, responds in defence of uh, McGee. So, granted, we have a counterexample to Modus Ponens only when we have true premises and a false conclusion, but of course, we can't simply assert, oh, here are true premises and a false conclusion, right? The assignment of truth values needs some justification. And that's what McGee does. That's why he talks about what it is rational to believe. We have good reason to believe that the premises are true and the conclusion false. Um, but I mean, ultimately, what he's saying is, no, right, this is a case where we have an argument in the form of modus ponens and we have true premises and a false conclusion. And then here are the reasons why we should think that the premises are true and the conclusion false. Um, indeed, it does seem to me actually that we can bypass questions of rational belief entirely because we can come up with a, a, you know, a model or a possible world in which the premises of the McGee arguments are true and the conclusion false. And that's enough for it to work as a counterexample because obviously uh, logical laws are supposed to hold in all circumstances, including all possible circumstances. Um, so take the, uh, the first argument. Let's suppose that we're in uh, some possible world, W1, which may not be the actual world. So in the closest possible world to W1, where a Republican other than Reagan wins, it is Anderson who wins. And this makes premise one true in W1. Uh, if a Republican wins the election, then if it's not Reagan, it will be Anderson, right? That's that's true in W1 because the closest possible world where a Republican other than Reagan wins is a world in which Anderson wins. In W1 itself, Reagan wins. So a Republican wins, and that obviously makes premise two true in W1. A Republican wins the election. And finally, in the closest possible world uh, to W1 where Reagan doesn't win, Carter wins. And this makes the conclusion false in W1. Again, the conclusion, if it's not Reagan who wins, it will be Anderson. Well, that's false, because in the closest possible world uh, where Reagan doesn't win, Carter wins. So W1 is a world in which this argument has true premises and a false conclusion. It's a scenario in which modus ponens fails to preserve truth. Now, of course, of course, all this talk of, you know, closest possible worlds is extremely problematic. Um, but hopefully you can see the point, right? Um, I mean, it does seem that if, if we're going to allow that these kinds of conditionals are truth apt in the first place, uh, and, you know, I mean, you, you may well object to that, but it, that's a common, it, it, it is the standard view, right, that a conditional like, uh, if it's not Reagan who wins, it will be Anderson, that that's just truth apt, and that we can make reliable judgments about whether it's true or false. If you accept that assumption, it looks like we can uh, describe a model in which the premises are true and the conclusion false. And that's all we need for this to work as a counterexample to modus ponens. So um, another, another response to the McGee examples is given by Matthew Mandelkern in his article, A Counterexample to Modus Ponens. Mandelkern's idea is that although modus ponens may not preserve truth, uh, perhaps we can argue that it preserves what he calls full rational acceptance. In a way, this response is the converse of the previous response. Anyway, Mandelkern dis distinguishes two kinds of modus ponens. He says there's truth conditional modus ponens, which preserves truth. This is the kind of modus ponens we are all familiar with. But another way to interpret modus ponens, uh, which Mandelkern calls informational uh, modus ponens, is that if you fully accept if P then Q, and you fully accept P, then you must fully accept Q. Now to fully accept a conclusion, you must conclusively, or at least very confidently, uh, rule out its contraries. Now McGee doesn't provide a counterexample to this. Suppose I fully accept that a Republican will win in the sense that I am completely ruling out that a Democrat will win. Imagine I'm told by God that a Republican will win. I have zero doubt about this. Well, then, in fact, I should accept the conclusion that if it's not Reagan who wins, it will be Anderson. With absolutely conclusive evidence that a Republican will win, there are only two options, Reagan or Anderson. Carter just isn't an option. Um, like, so... What, what McGee's counterexample trades on is that although it's true that a Republican will win the election, and although I have good reason to believe that a Republican will win the election, 
I take it that the, you know, the next most probable outcome is that a Democrat will win. Um, you know, so, so, so I haven't fully accepted that a Republican will win. Uh, if, you know, if I say, if it's not Reagan who wins, it will be Carter and Carter is a Democrat. Well, and I'm not fully ruling out that somebody other than a Republican will win the election. Um, so from an informational perspective, Mandelkern says, an argument is valid if and only if any body of information that incorporates all of its premises also incorporates its conclusion by virtue of logical form. But the McGee examples only work if you don't fully incorporate the premises into your information. To fully incorporate the premise that a Republican will win, you are committed to believing that a Republican will win, no matter which Republican it is. So even if Reagan fails, it will be some other Republican. And so the winner will be Carter, that will be um, Anderson, not Carter. Um, and so if you think through um, the McGee argument with, with this in mind, you can see that there's no longer any uh, challenge to modus ponens, right? So if a Republican wins the election, then if it's not Reagan who wins, it will be Anderson. That's premise one. Premise two, a Republican will win the election. Now, if you fully, if you, if you fully accept that, so that you're completely ruling out the possibility of a Democrat winning, then you can indeed derive the conclusion, you can accept the conclusion that if it's not Reagan who wins, it will be Anderson. So I think that one immediate thing to note about Mandelkern's argument is that it's actually already a fairly radical conclusion uh, to say that modus ponens fails to preserve truth. Um, you know, very rarely are logical laws presented in terms of uh, full rational acceptance. They're generally viewed in the truth conditional way. So uh, we're already granting a lot of ground to McGee here if we grant that in his examples, uh, truth conditional modus ponens fails. Uh, obviously, another concern about Mandelkern's response is how precisely to spell out this idea that he calls full rational acceptance. What exactly is this state? Um, I mean, apparently there's a difference between so there's, there's a difference between believing that a Republican will win and fully accepting that a Republican will win. Um, what's odd is that it's not clear what evidence could make this difference. So, so actually, even if God told you that a Republican will win, so you have absolutely no doubt that a Republican will win, you might still endorse the claim that if it wasn't Reagan who would win, it would be Carter. Indeed, that actually looks like the right thing to say if Carter is the, like, if Carter is in second place. Um, so full acceptance doesn't seem to just be a matter of having no doubt, of, of being certain. Um, and again, that maybe is, is perhaps a bit of a problem, uh, spelling out exactly what this state is supposed to be. However, the most important uh, response to Mandelkern is actually noted by Mandelkern himself, which is that other counterexamples can be found for which the full acceptance idea doesn't work. So actually there are counterexamples to informational modus ponens as well. Um, so Mandelkern focuses on certain subjunctive conditionals. Suppose that a doctor and a nurse are observing a patient, Jones. Now, Jones has symptoms characteristic of people who, first of all, have bronchitis, and second, have genotype A or B. Um, and the, the doctor is trying to convince the nurse that Jones has bronchitis, uh, and she asserts, premise one, if Jones had bronchitis, then if he had been in genotype A, he would be showing the symptoms he is actually showing. Um, now, similarly, we could assert X. If Jones had bronchitis, then if he had been in genotype B, he would be showing the symptoms he is actually showing. There's no doubt about either of these propositions. We fully accept both of them. Um, but suppose that people of genotype A tend to be immune to bronchitis. Uh, they can get it in some circumstances, but it's extremely rare. When they get it, they do in fact display the symptoms that Jones is displaying. So yeah, we, we know, given Jones's symptoms, that it's, it's most plausible that he has bronchitis and is in genotype B, right? Like that's, that's the most plausible scenario right here. Um, because we also think, well, if he, if he had been in genotype A, he probably wouldn't have gotten bronchitis in the first place because people with genotype A don't tend to get bronchitis. Again, they, they can do, but it's extremely, extremely rare. Um, 
So now consider again premise one. Um, if Jones had bronchitis, then if he had genotype A, he would be showing the symptoms he is actually showing. Okay, we accept this. Um, we also accept premise two, that Jones has bronchitis. Uh, we may have decisive evidence that Jones has bronchitis. Uh, we can maybe conduct a bacterial assay which shows conclusively that it's bronchitis. Or again, maybe God comes down and tells us that he has bronchitis. Uh, we fully accept that Jones has bronchitis because we're going to take it that he has bronchitis regardless of whether he has genotype A or B. Right? Like n Nothing else that we learn about Jones is going to change our judgment that he has bronchitis. Right? This is th so this is why we fully accept premise two in this case, because we like, e even if it turns out that he actually isn't in genotype B or whatever, we're still going to judge that he has bronchitis. So we have these two premises. Even so, we don't accept the conclusion that if Jones had been in genotype A, he would be showing the symptoms he's actually showing, because we know that people in genotype A tend not to get bronchitis. And Obviously, if he had not gotten bronchitis in the first place, he wouldn't be showing the symptoms of bronchitis. Um, or at least there's no reason to believe he would be showing such symptoms. So again, this, so, so this is a case, according to Mandelkern, of where we fully accept the two premises, but we do not fully accept the conclusion. So anyway, if we think that modus ponens fails as a logical law, might this cast other philosophical problems in a different light? Well, take, for instance, the Sorites paradox. When we have a vague predicate such as heap, uh, then by repeated application of modus ponens, we can reach an absurd conclusion. So one million grains is a heap. If one million grains is a heap, then 999,999 grains is a heap, etc. Right? I mean, you know how this argument goes. This continues until we get to the absurd conclusion that one grain is a heap. Um, or you can go the other way. You know, you can start off by saying that one grain is not a heap, and if one grain is not a heap, then two grains is not a heap. You know, by, by adding, by either adding or subtracting one grain, you don't go from heap to not heap. Right? That's the, that's the key point. And by repeated application of modus ponens, you then generate the, uh, the absurd conclusion. Um, the issue, of course, is that there is no clear dividing line between heaps and non-heaps. There's no specific number of grains that make a heap. Um, maybe we should say, say that modus ponens fails in certain contexts of vagueness. So the Sorites is perhaps another context in which modus ponens is not valid. Of course, there are plenty of responses to Sorites paradoxes, and if, uh, if modus ponens does fail in this context, we need to provide some other account of how we can reason with vague predicates. Um, but, you know, it's, it's just worth noting, right, once once we're open to the idea of counterexamples to modus ponens, you might find many more counterexamples in other areas. Um, so this is presented as a paradox to be solved, but maybe um, you should just accept, oh, this is a case where modus ponens is, is not uh, valid or where modus ponens does not hold. So those were some counterexamples to modus ponens. Let's now consider modus tollens. Uh, again, this is a classic argument, if P then Q, not Q, therefore not P. Uh, this counterexample comes from Seth Yalchin in his paper, A Counterexample to Modus Tollens. Take an urn that contains 100 marbles. Some are blue, some are red, some are big, some are small. The breakdown is as follows. The uh, blue big marbles are, there's 10 of them, blue small, there's 50. Uh, red, big, 30, red, small, 10. Now, let's say I select a marble at random without, without looking and I place it under a cup. Well, we can make the following claims about this marble. Um, premise one, if the marble is big, then it's probably red. Because of course, if you take the big marbles, which is the first line here, then you can see there's 30 red and 10 blue. So if the marble is big, then it's probably red. Premise two, the marble is not probably red, because if you just look at the red versus the blue, you can see that there's 40 red versus 60 blue. So the marble is not probably red. But it does not follow from this that the marble is not big. The marble could be big. Uh, now, of course, it's more likely to be small. Um, you know, it's maybe you'd say, yeah, it's, it's, it's 
probably small, because overall there are 60 small ones and 40 big ones. But that's not the conclusion of applying modus tollens to these premises. The conclusion is the marble is not big. And we wouldn't draw this conclusion. Indeed, the conclusion may well be, fa may well be false. So we could have true premises and a false conclusion. Right? We may well have a big marble um, un under, under the cup, even though the two premises would still be true. If the marble is big, it's probably red. The marble is not probably red. Those probability claims, we would still accept them. So this seems to be a case where we have a modus tollens argument with true premises and a false conclusion. So I'll note a couple of responses to this example. First, one response is that we must be careful in interpreting the, the logical form of the argument, because what we've done here is we're tempted to render it like this. If P, then probably Q, not probably Q, therefore not P. This is an instance of modus tollens with true premises and a false conclusion. Um, but arguably, the probability operator actually has scope over the conditional operator. So the form of the argument would instead be probably if P then Q, not probably Q, therefore not P. Um, so we, we'd say that in this, sec in this latter case, the probability operator in the first premise has wide scope. Um, it, it kind of attaches to the conditional as a whole, not to the uh, consequent of the conditional. Um, and this obviously isn't really an instance of modus tollens. So there is therefore no challenge to modus tollens to be found here. The question, of course, is why we would interpret the logical form of, of this first premise. So when we say if the marble is big, then it's probably red. Why would we interpret that as really having the logical form? Probably if the marble is big, then it's red. Um, there are actually some problems with this wide scope reading. Um, so one is that this argument, the following argument, seems to be perfectly fine. If the marble is big, then it's probably red. The marble is big, therefore it's probably red. Um, that looks like a perfectly legitimate application of modus ponens. Um, but of course, this is only an instance of modus ponens if the probability operator um, has narrow scope, if it attaches to the consequent of the conditional, not the conditional as a whole. It's also worth considering um, other types of uh, claims with probability operators. So consider uh, conjunctive consequence with probability operators. Again, we have a conditional where, where the consequent of the conditional is a conjunction. So if Sally is at the party, then Isaac is at the party and Steve is probably at the party. Well, you wouldn't read the probability operator as having wide scope in this case. We wouldn't say that this is equivalent to uh, probably if Sally is at the party, then Isaac is at the party and Steve is at the party. Like those are obviously different claims. So reading the probability operator as attaching to the conditional as a whole, as being probably if the marble is big, then it's red, seems completely unmotivated. Um, and of course, we could make that probability claim, but the point is that we don't need to, and that's not the natural reading of the argument. A second objection is that the term probably is context sensitive, and its semantic contribution is not the same over the course of the argument. So what is denied in premise two is not the antecedent of premise one. Why should we think there is context shifting happening here? Well, premise one states a conditional probability. It states the probability that the marble is, uh, it, it is red if it is big. Um, it's probably red given that it is big. This is conditional probability, the probability of one proposition conditional on another proposition. But what is denied in premise two is not a conditional probability. Um, premise two simply says it's not probably red, right? You know, we're simply denying that the marble is probably red and that's all. So should we say, so, so is it the case then that the meaning of the term probably changes throughout the argument? Well, the trouble with this objection is we can accept that there is conditional probability in premise one, but not premise two, while still holding that the semantic contribution of the probability operator is the same. So while still holding that the term probably means the same thing. Um, after all, why are we treating the probability in premise one as conditional probability? Well, 
just because it's a conditional claim, right? We're saying if P then Q. And obviously that's necessary to make the modus tollens argument in the first place. We don't assume that the meanings of other words change when they are embedded in conditionals. Uh, so it's not really clear what the motivation would be for supposing that the meaning of the term probably changes just because it's embedded in a conditional claim. Um, again, this, this seems unmotivated. Okay, here's another counterexample to modus tollens. Uh, this one uses embedded indicatives like the McGee counterexamples. Suppose that Carr, Allen, and Brown run a shop. There's always one of them in the shop, so we accept premise one. If Carr is out, then if Allen is out, Brown is in. Because there's always one of them in the shop, so you know if both Carr and Allen are out, Brown must be in. Um, but we also know that Allen never leaves without Brown. So it's not the case that if Alan is out, Brown is in. If we apply modus tollens to these, we get the conclusion, car is in. But we can't conclude this because actually if Alan is in, car might be out. Um, here's one using moral concepts. If you, if you will kill him, you ought to kill him gently. It's not the case that you ought to kill him gently. Apply modus tollens and we get the conclusion that you will not kill him. Um, and of course that conclusion doesn't follow. Um, okay, so yeah, I mean, uh, if, if one is a moral realist, then this uh, maybe is a, is a challenge uh, to modus tollens. Um, if you think that those premises are true, which many moral realists will accept the truth of those premises, uh, it doesn't seem that um, you can get the conclusion, you get any conclusion about how people will actually act from the truth of those premises. So those are some counterexamples to modus ponens and modus tollens. How in general might we respond to these counterexamples? Can we save the laws of logic? Well, notice the structure of the argumentation here. A law of logic is proposed. So we propose a law that governs all reasoning, regardless of the subject matter or context or whatever. So modus ponens, if P then Q, P therefore Q. If you accept the premises, you must accept the conclusion on pain of inconsistency, no matter what propositions are substituted for P and Q. This holds universally. That's what it is for something to be a law of logic. But then a counter example is proposed, a case where it seems clear that the premises are true and the conclusion false. This seems to show that modus ponens does not hold universally. What are the options here? Well, one option is to argue that the counterexample fails because we have not rendered its form properly. Um, we see this move in the case of Yalchin's example involving the urn with the objection that the probability operator has wide scope. And so therefore it doesn't even have the form of modus tollens, right? So whenever, so if somebody proposes an apparent counterexample, you might say, well, actually, it, this just doesn't even have the right like form. Actually, you shouldn't. It shouldn't be. You know, if p then q, p therefore q. That's not really how the argument should be rendered. Another option is to argue that the counterexample fails because it is actually a successful instance of the law. We can try to show that either the premises are false or the conclusion is actually true. Um, or we may argue that uh, the uh, that the laws of logic are supposed to preserve something other than truth, and the premises um, you know, do not have this other thing. This is what we see with Mandelkern's idea of full acceptance. Informational modus ponens preserves full acceptance, not truth, um, but we don't fully accept the premises uh, in the case of the McGee examples. The basic idea of this second response is, look, whatever property it is that is supposed to be preserved by our logical laws, well, we can argue that in the purported counterexample, either the premises do not have the property or the conclusion does have the property, right? Because in order to have a successful counterexample to a logical law, then whatever property it is that is supposed to be preserved by logical laws, you need to, show, you need to give an example where the premises have the property and the conclusion does not have the property. So, you know, we, so, we, so we might instead say, no, actually, either the premises do not have this property or the conclusion does have the property in the case of the purported counterexample. Um, obviously, you know, it's not likely to work. This response isn't likely to work in all such cases. As we've seen, um, many of these proposed counterexamples are not particularly technical, but this is uh, another possible response. A third option is to say that the proposed counterexample isn't really an instance of the purported logical law due to some problem with the 
content of the concepts. Um, so, we, so we're familiar with this move in, in, other, in, in the case of something like equivocation. Um, if Frank is an ass, then he has fur. Frank is an ass, therefore he has fur. But suppose that Frank is a human that you dislike. Well, in the first premise, ass means donkey. In the second premise, ass means that Frank is obnoxious, right? Like that's the, so if Frank is an ass, then he has fur. That's true if we take ass to re refer to donkeys. In the second premise, Frank is an ass. That's true if we mean uh, ass, if we mean by ass that Frank is obnoxious. Um, so basically we have equivocated, right? Uh, this is not actually an instance of modus ponens because in a legitimate instance of modus ponens, the meanings of the terms must be held fixed throughout. Um, so what this shows us is that mere syntactic form isn't good enough for an argument to be an instance of modus ponens. You can't just say if p then q, p therefore q. Uh, for one thing, you also need to hold the meanings of p and q fixed throughout the argument. In, in cases of equivocation, well, logic just doesn't cover that. Well, the point is we can make a similar response to any proposed counterexample. We can argue that for one reason or another, it's not really an instance of the law because there's just something wrong or something defective about the concepts that are being used. Um, we might argue that there are certain terms or concepts which are just defective. Uh, many early analytic philosophers, including Frege and Russell, endorsed this response with respect to Sorites paradoxes, which, as we saw earlier, um, you know, the, the, so we saw, we saw earlier that in these cases, that vague, vague predicates generate uh, these paradoxes by the repeated application of modus ponens. The response of some of these early analytic philosophers was, well, these kinds of vague terms are just to be eliminated from the language. Um, they're defective. So the Sorites paradoxes are not really a challenge to the universality of logic. And of course, then there's uh, actually the fourth option, which is the one taken by the nihilist. Uh, we can hold that the counterexample really is an instance of modus ponens or whatever. So modus ponens does not hold universally. Um, now, of course, if we say that, we have to specify the various exceptions to modus ponens. There are plenty of contexts in which modus ponens works perfectly fine, so yeah, we're going to want to find the exceptions. There may not be any algorithm for finding these. Um, now, an interesting point here is that, in practice, there's really little difference between the third option and this fourth option. Uh, the third option you know, says that the law holds universally and that the cases where it seems to fail are not really instances of the law. The fourth option says the law doesn't hold universally because the cases where it seems to fail really are instances of the law. But either way, um, an argument may exhibit the right kind of syntactic form, right? So it might have the form of if p then q, p therefore q, but actually have true premises and a false conclusion. Um, yeah, or, or, or at least, uh, you know, we um, are not going to accept this as a legitimate instance of the logical law. Um, so, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting how the you know, logical nihilism obviously comes, probably comes across as a fairly radical uh, position, but uh, in some ways, you know, it's, it's a position which is actually quite close to uh, views which have been held by um, major philosophers in the past. Anyway, um, that's all uh, I'm going to talk about today. I uh, hope that was interesting. And that's all. Yeah. Goodbye.